editor's introduction to the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson introduction here are boys all sorts of boys french english italian american young artists budding novelists and poets musicians drab and spectacled london office clerks just off a stool an auctioneer from brixton elderly married men as old as thirty-five and little nephews of sixteen catholics protestants christians jews grave young students in arms crusaders of france oxford and cambridge men and french schoolboys american college men and american rich men sons from new york and california a ball player from kentucky those splendid canadians favorites of fortune and widow sons french prisoners in germany and german prisoners in france and little antonio in austria looking longingly out across the sea to italy aviators ambulance drivers truck drivers stretcher bearers gunners plucky british officers willing to bear the blunt and dashing young st cyrans going into battle in white gloves and plume the elite of the world the new aristocracy not waiting to see or to be summoned but at the first call to arms rushing forth as kipling writes as jostling for honor these are soldiers letters written home but reading one finds that he does not think of them as letters at all but as boys enzo antonio robert arthur gaston william marcel harry victor and one is filled with pity that they are boys mere men as more than one of them says pitted against professional soldiers experts in the refined arts of modern war but if one thing more than another is revealed in the letters it is that the writers do not want to be pitied rather envied one boy tells his parents an american by his speech not with their worrying to take the edge off from his own complete contentment with what he is doing a french boy says not to call him poor jean rather to say dear jean or brave jean or even little jean but not poor jean all express in one way and another that death has no terrors for the good soldier never probably in the history of the world have so many letters been written as during the great war at the front it is said that the most important order of the day is not a trench raid a gas attack or a big bombardment but first food and next mail at home the mail would probably be put first many of the letters reveal not only an unexpected literary talent since most of the writers are very young but invariably a wonderful spirit the spirit of the good soldier quick to resent injustice and wrong eager to fight for what he believes is right and willing to die for it too no one can read the letters of these glorious boys and not resent the belittling assumption that all the fighting men are dumb victims of a capitalistic war driven against their will nor can one believe it is adventure alone calling to youth a few here and there to be sure may have been like the little nephew the sixteen-year-old french boy who thought the firing and the guns especially arranged to please me but almost without exception no matter in what spirit they entered the war once in it they become gravely conscious of its great issues and are determined not only to do their bit but their all and see it through some of the boys fight for mamma others for grandmother this means alsace others fight with the bayonet to avenge the honor of the french women our sisters some rush to the assault shouting savoya others vive la france but all are only varying expressions of the same thing there is unanimity of opinion no matter what the language that they are engaged in a war against war itself a war for freedom and justice not only for one's own country but for every one a war as one young italian poetically puts it against those who would kill the light 
in every collection of letters that has been published among much that is personal and boyish and at times is manifestly the supreme literary effort of a young life there is generally one letter more sober than the rest and serious beyond the years of the writer such a letter is not necessarily a conscious last words boys do not like a fuss but something written in a more solemn mood perhaps dimly prescient these letters are most often addressed to mothers and oddly enough endeavour to give rather than to seek comfort these are the days when men should be born without mothers one writes but another says more truly that on the contrary these are the days when mothers should be proud as spartan mothers on the battle line it is said a soldier derives comfort and courage from contact with his fellows the touch of shoulder and elbow in the same manner it has seemed that some of these letters should be brought in a volume together they belong together the enemy may extend its empire over the world sweep it from sea to sea but the spirit of these letters cannot be defeated the dead will rise again n p d end of editor's introduction part one of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain enzo valentini it must be that some of the ecstasy and beautiful and poetic spirit of st francis of assisi entered into a boy of the neighboring hilltop town of perugia enzo valentini was the son of count valentini mayor of perugia he was a student of the college of perugia and was rarely gifted a lover of poetry and the natural sciences he read fabre and maeterlinck he was also an artist one of his last etchings shows some trees he called the survivors not realizing that in belgium and france not even the trees survive upon italy's declaration of war in may nineteen fifteen enzo valentini enlisted as a private he was unwilling to wait for anything else to be arranged he was eighteen he immediately entered into the life of the barracks he refused to return home at night as he would have been permitted to do his one passionate desire was to train my body and elevate my soul for the great sacrifice after he had been two days in the barracks he wrote to his aunt barracks life has transformed me in two days i have become accustomed to everything to sleep on straw between two double bass performers to wash the mess tins to drill and handle the gun i have become accustomed to the most heterogeneous company and to the greatest assortment of smells a susceptible nose could possibly imagine moreover now that i have adapted myself to it the military life suits me very well the vin ordinaire is excellent for example the bread is also very good cut into thin small pieces and swimming in the tin it reminds me of pigeon soup the pigeon is lacking but i imagine it so well that the effect is the same in the same way i imagine that the coffee is well sweetened that the half-empty straw mattress serving me as a couch is a bed of down and more of the same sort imagination makes me happy aided by enthusiasm that has become my regular disposition instead of an occasional and foolish exhilaration your letter has given me the greatest pleasure one sees with how much love you accompany me but your compliments are exaggerated i deserve no credit for what i have done it is the joy of my soul that i have translated into acts and not the melancholy product of my brain soon i shall be writing you from the front when two months have passed since dead with fatigue and drunk with joy he arrived at the front he writes to his mother that it seems as if it were only yesterday and that searching his conscience he finds that he has lost nothing unless it is little meannesses and cowardices while he has gained inestimable spiritual treasures he is sure that he has discovered the secret of happiness i am happy little mother and i think that i have found the secret of being happy always 
he tells her not to worry for fear he will rush into any foolish heroisms he says that would be wrong because it would consume the energy that should be saved for the moment of the ultimate sacrifice he left perugia in july he never returned in less than three months he was killed in the attack in which he lost his life it is said he was the first out of the trench arriving at an advanced position he and one of his comrades embraced each other he showed his friend his cap in which he had put a sprig of edelweiss he said when he jumped out of the trench he saw it at his feet isn't it pretty he asked it will bring me luck then shouting italia savoia he went on he was hit by five bullets before departing for the front enzo valentini made his will and testament to be opened only in the case of his death the last poetic words of which are be strong little mother from beyond he sends to you his farewell to papa to his brothers to all who have loved him your son who has given his body to fight against those who would kill the light letter of enzo valentini little mother in several days i am going to depart for the front i am writing my farewell to you which you are to read only if i die let it also be my farewell to papa to my brothers to all those who have cared for me in this world since on earth my heart in its love and recognition has always to you given its best thoughts it is to you also that i wish to make known my last wishes try if you can not to weep for me too much think that even if i do not return i am not for that reason dead it my body the inferior part of me may suffer and die but not i i the soul cannot die because i come from god and must return to god i was born for happiness and through the happiness that is at the bottom of all suffering i am to return into everlasting joy if at times i have been the prisoner of my body it has not been for always my death is a liberation the beginning of the true life the return to the infinite therefore do not weep for me if you think of the immortal beauty of the ideas for which my soul has desired to sacrifice my body you will not weep but if your mother's heart mourns let the tears flow they will always be sacred the tears of a mother may god keep count of them they will be the stars of her crown an anonymous soldier the letters of an unnamed soldier to his mother are literature the young soldier was a painter but the war made him a poet it is doubtful if he ever would have painted pictures more beautiful than many in these letters soft weather after rain bells in the evening flowing waters singing under the bridge trees settling to sleep he writes to his mother there are three of us we two and the pretty landscape from my window this french soldier cannot bring himself to write about the horrors of the war he prefers to consider the certainties the tempest has made clear to me these certainties from which he never swerves are duty and effort after five days of horror in which his company was cut to pieces twelve hundred were killed not a superior officer remained above him and his captain fell before his eyes just as he was telling him he would report him for citation the most he has to tell is that he has done his duty his whole effort is to raise his soul where events can have no empire over it we must feel he writes to his mother that all human uprooting is a little thing and what is truly ourselves is the life of the soul nothing attacks the soul although we lead the life of rabbits on the first day of the season's hunting notwithstanding that we can enrich our souls in a magnificent way an englishman a clutton brock says of these letters that before the war not comprehending so well then an anglo-saxon would have said of him that they are very french that is to say very unlike what an englishman or an american would write to his mother or indeed to any one an englishman having the same abhorrence of war as this frenchman mr Coulat brock says would be a conscientious objector 
but although he uses the words torment and sacrifice in connection with himself in the war he is in it of his own free will and for all his soul's worth one of the first letters says know that it would be shameful to think for one instant of holding back when the race demands the sacrifice and again if you knew the shame i should endure to think that i might have done something more oh my beautiful country the heart of the world he apostrophizes france in many beautiful passages and says it needed only the horror to make him know how filial and profound are the ties which bind him to it only once is he plainly rebellious and then oddly enough he is most human and appealing but oh dearest mother the war is long too long for men who had something else to do in the world but even then he is not like jephthah's daughter who asked for a brief respite to bewail her youth no no he writes i will not mourn over my dead youth and he recognizes the duty of accepting the mission in life that presents itself only he would have liked to have been one of the torch-bearers to have carried the flag the french soldier has not been heard of since one of the severe battles in the argonne in april nineteen fifteen since he himself is thus one of the missing it is significant to find him writing to his mother in one of his many efforts to have them make their grief and even their love impersonal the following i hope that when you think of me you will have in mind all those who have left everything behind their family their surroundings their whole social environment all those of whom their nearest and dearest think only in the past saying we had once a brother who many years ago withdrew from the world we know nothing of his fate the words may serve as an epitaph letter of anonymous french soldier january twenty three nineteen fifteen when my trials become less hard then i begin to think to dream and the past that is dear to me seems to have that same remote poetry which in happier days drew my thoughts to distant countries a familiar street or certain well-known corners spring suddenly to my mind just as in other days islands of dreams and legendary countries used to rise at the call of certain music and verse but now there is no need of verse or music the intensity of dear memories is enough i have not even any idea of what a new life could be i only know that we are making life here and now for whom and for what age it hardly matters what i do know and what is affirmed in the very depths of my being is that this harvest of french genius will be safely stored and that the intellect of our race will not suffer for the deep cuts that have been made in it who will say that the rough peasant comrade of the fallen thinker will not be the inheritor of his thoughts no experience can falsify this magnificent intuition the peasant's son who has witnessed the death of the young scholar or artist will perhaps take up the interrupted work be perhaps a link in the chain of evolution which has been for the moment suspended this is the real sacrifice to renounce the hope of being the torch-bearer to a child in a game it is a fine thing to carry the flag but for a man it is enough to know that the flag will be carried and that is what every moment of august nature brings home to me every moment reassures my heart nature makes flags of everything they are more beautiful than those to which our little habits cling antonio there is a cripple in rome his name was enrico totti he was a familiar figure in the trestevere quarter where he made little wooden toys and sold them insisting upon going to the front he was at first employed only as a messenger but it was not long before he was fighting when he was finally mortally wounded he cried viva la italia viva trieste viva il bersaglier and he hurled his crutch in the direction of the enemy as he fell 
many of the italian letters have this heroic quality to less impressionable anglo-saxon minds it may even seem theatric and familiarly operatic most of the letters are frankly nationalistic their rallying cry is savoia we shout unceasingly savoia savoia one of the soldiers writes the light gleaming on the towers of trieste is their shining goal the war for italy is another war of italian independence the fourth it is the opportunity to destroy once and for all time the reputation of the italians as a nation of mandolin players existing for no other purpose than to serenade and amuse the rest of the world no no we will not be a museum a hotel a winter resort a horizon painted in prussian blue for international honeymoons d'annunzio said in one of his fiery speeches some of the letters of the italians are almost childlike in their naivete and simple faith others have a wider vision and all have this note of heroism a sailor writes to his mother but thou must not weep because one weeps over the tomb of a son who dies not over that of a soldier who falls in the sacred battle the mamma mia of a letter written by a young italian prisoner of the dreaded austrians is as poignant as the similar cry of tiridu in mascagna's little music drama it has the essence of poetry letter of antonio prisoner of the austrians oh mamma mia if you could see to what your son is reduced they have sent me here to dig trenches on the shore of the sea and when we can do no more they beat us and the other day two of our number died oh my mother i pray you on my knees go every day to the church and pray for your son to the blessed virgin of the rosary and to our great protector st anthony because they alone possess the grace to save thy poor son who is dying of hunger and weakness for one works fifteen hours a day and they give us to eat three boiled potatoes and then many beatings the other day a fisherman gave me two fishes and i ate them raw which at one time would have filled me with disgust but when there is hunger everything is good yesterday i was thinking so much of my dear country and of my mother that many tears fell from my eyes and the sergeant of the guard gave me a kick and wished to throw me into the sea oh mamma mia when the weather is fine i see far far away across the sea a strip of land which they have told me is italy and i wish to throw myself into the sea and swim to return to my dear country but the sea is so deep deep and i do not know how to swim and i can do nothing but weep when i see how many of my companions are dying oh dear mother i wish that i could close my eyes for always so that i could not see any more of this wretchedness but i think of thee and of my dear country and of the hearth where we sat to tell stories and i think of angiolina whom i love so well and whom i have promised to marry and now i pray so much to the blessed virgin of the rosary and to our lord jesus who has had thorns on his head and has suffered so greatly that he will give me strength to support this anguish and also thou my mother pray for thy dear son that he may not close his eyes in this inferno and that he may return home safe and sound keep well my mother and receive many kisses and embraces from thy unhappy prisoner son farewell farewell thy son antonio robert le roux hugo le roux one of the editors of the matin in paris and french man of letters well known in this country lost his only son in the early days of the war robert le roux's first letter is dated august two nineteen fourteen which shows that he was in at the beginning his parting words to his father were you know that i shall do my duty and a little more if i have the chance he did the little more he received his death wound at the first contact with the enemy while leading his men in an heroic charge on september twenty sixth nineteen fourteen monsieur leroux received a letter from his son in hospital which said i have been wounded in the arm but that is nothing another bullet passed through the lungs the spine is bad 
this is tiresome for my legs are paralyzed but they tell me that as the wound is a clean one i shall recover that is all i am able to write you owing to the kindness of m n one of the officials of the hospital the signature of the letter was unsteady and enclosed was a note from m n saying he had written at the boy's dictation and that he had no chance the young sub-lieutenant had kept his diary until a few days before he fell on the field of honor in his last hours while the paralysis was creeping towards his heart he told his father the rest of the story which m leroux wrote down exactly as he told it under pretense of sending to his fiancée just before he died the boy raised up in his bed and cried out almost violently as his father says come come she is bigger now is she not and when his father asked who is bigger he made a supreme effort and said france letter of robert leroux you know as well as i do that the instinctive moment at such a time doesn't carry you forward i thought of you of mamma of guy of marie rose and of Hélène. i said to you in my heart it is for you and then my eyes closed i plunged forward the wood was behind us we were crawling in the open you know the manoeuvre the moment there is a lull you bound forward on all fours i was in the midst of my men we advanced as though we were swimming the horizon was hidden by a hilltop which at about three hundred meters from us rose up against the sky the germans who were entrenched behind the slope had plenty of time to take good aim at us as though we were so many hares started up i did not stop to count those who fell i cried out closer closer and i threw myself ahead of the men to encourage them thus bounding on in a series of leaps we covered about two hundred meters and started to crawl up the slope at each move my section was thinning out but the men followed me one grows accustomed to everything now it seemed as though the bullets were not intended for me i could see myself at the top of the hill already i opened my mouth to call out again onward my boys when a column of earth and dust passed over us and glued us to the ground the boches had brought up their machine guns in addition the rain was rattling down i threw off the earth that had fallen on me i seized by his shoulders a soldier lying on my right i did the same for a man on my left and the others they did not move they stared at me with their poor eyes i could not tell whether they had been killed or had died of fright for a moment i was in despair this was not what they had pledged me i stood up in the hailing bullets and shouted with all my strength if i am killed it is your fault but as long as you lie there i shall remain standing they roused themselves again we moved forward i thought to myself the sergeant won't come back and the major is dying i must go to them and lose no time about it otherwise i shall not know whether he wants me to go across the hill so i got up and in order to hasten matters instead of creeping over the ground i ran toward my chief i did not go far gaston rio i greet you sentinel on the bridge of europe live bird in your vines lark in your field cock singing at dawn of the centuries on yon farm and as a peasant entering the hall out of respect for the masters of the house and that he may not soil the finely waxed floor carefully removes his boots and holds them in his hand so in your honour o france i put aside the heavy perturbation of my spirit the gaze with which i look upon you shall be clear my eyes shall look with love o cherished country o oh, ancient wisdom built up century after century o oh, courage of the world heart of the west nation inventive intelligent o oh, living one republic i hail you by your glorious name henri franc quoted by pierre de la noue in one year gaston rieux went on an official mission to germany 
he visited its principal cities and met and talked with its principal scholars and foremost men including among many others a cousin of the former chancellor Wertmann holweg the following year gaston rieu was squatting as he writes in the dark corner of a crypt hungry thirsty stupefied he was a prisoner of war in a bavarian fortress he was in fort orf eleven months and had time to think of the manly talks of the year before when the germans almost unanimously had told him that the future was germany's who would succeed the aged and dying france gaston rieu as it happened was one of the young frenchmen who thought otherwise who believed passionately in the france of to-morrow m emile faguet writes of rieu his ardor his fire his impetus the rush of his blood are all instinct with the passion of patriotism the year before the war in nineteen thirteen he had written a book called au écoutre de la france qui vient in which he said some things that were later to be regarded prophecy that a splendid to-morrow worthy of the finest epochs of our history is now germinating in the furrows of the motherland the book was widely discussed and karl lamplecht the pan-german historian delivered two lectures on it it is dedicated to the italian historian ferrero gaston rieu was one of the first to go to the war he took part in the fighting in lorraine and was mentioned in the dispatches his entire division was wiped out he was wounded and taken prisoner in the battle of dieuz the little lorraine town where only the week before a joyous welcome had been given to the french pay for a book oh monsieur i could not take money from a french soldier instead the girl gave him a goblet of moselle in Rieu's letters and diary, prison fare is the chief topic. He says, It seems strange to a man who believed himself to live on ideas to be reduced to become nothing but a stomach. He tells of the cheese evenings, when the half of a Gruyere cheese was the entire dinner for four hundred and eighty men. But the prisoners are cheerful, and when the Russians arrive, they not only share with them, but scrub them. And the Russians are grateful the men formed in line to receive their rations the procession lasted an hour as at a great funeral the frivolous and impious frenchmen as they told out their basins say the holy water for the soup and the handful of earth for the three ounces of meat letter of gaston rieu but imprisonment is above all things hunger chronic hunger those only who have experienced it can understand the effect which chronic hunger speedily exercises even upon an active brain at first it induces hallucinations with terrible realism the sufferer recalls meals eaten before the war some particular dinner such and such a picnic the nerves of taste and smell exasperated by the scanty regimen are visited by memories of odors and tastes the man thinks of nothing but eating literally he is nothing but a clamorous stomach he will lie awake the entire night thinking only of this what can i do to-morrow morning to secure a supplementary loaf little brissot my friend of the alpine infantry when we were walking a few days ago with our two medical officers made the unexpected confession only one thing can give me pleasure now to get food only one man interests me the man who is capable of getting me food this calm declaration from one so highly cultured that he will distract his mind from the cares of important business by reading james and bergson from one intimately acquainted with montaigne and the lake poets seem to us neither paradoxical nor irrelevant nor cynical our rations are dwindling this morning the quartermaster delivered to the kitchen staff so scanty an allowance of coffee and roasted barley that it hardly seemed to darken the water in our eight cauldrons on sunday each man had to be content with one and one-third ounce of semolina at midday and with two-thirds ounce of vermicelli in the evening and what are we to think of this heap of potatoes on the ground at my feet is it intended to feed five hundred men or one section 
it is hardly an exaggeration to say we are starving our dietary is still further reduced to-day we had some horrible little prunes two years old and hard as wood in lieu of meat end of part one part two of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain a german prisoner in france the british tommies have been accused of making pets of their german prisoners immediately putting cigarettes into their mouths and buying food and drink for them a letter written by a young german prisoner to his mother also pays fine tribute to the french care of the german prisoners and wounded owing to his great love for the fatherland the german prisoner tells his mother that his heart had wavered and struggled up to the moment when it was conquered by this eternal recognition that i owe to the country that has taken in the wounded that their countrymen left on the ground to die like dogs the letter is quoted by m ernest daudet and has been stored away in the great and growing documents for the history of the war letter of a german prisoner in france i spent the whole day of thursday september ten and the night of thursday to friday on the battlefield wrapped in a ragged coat on friday afternoon i was carried to the schoolhouse converted into a field hospital you will permit me dear parents not to narrate to you the manner in which we were abandoned at the time of the retreat of our army it's a bad business take my word for it and far from being to the honor of the german red cross which i think will not in the future be able to glory in its conduct on the battlefield who knows but you can believe me the sensations of war are terrible as for example to awake one morning and see yourself surrounded by french and then with nothing more to do at the military hospital at bruges as also at bar le duc we were the object of the most assiduous and eager attention i know your heart my dear mamma i know how good you are go then also to relieve the misery of the poor french wounded and do for them as much good as you can yes do it i beg you in recognition of what in france they have done for your son it occurs to me that there are some french books at home give them i beg you for me to the french wounded who must be mortally dull a prey to a terrible homesickness as i am arthur george heath arthur george heath was a fellow and tutor at new college oxford when he joined the army in august nineteen fourteen he had a passion for music and a talent for it he was not a born soldier he was one of the many oxford and cambridge men of high promise sacrificed to the war whose ideals as professor gilbert murray says were gentle and who were apparently unfitted in mind or body for war and yet when the call came went gaily forth as jostling for honor when arthur heath was killed in france in october nineteen fifteen many testified to his bravery it was said his men would have followed him anywhere perhaps because as he humorously quotes from a tommy's letter he himself was willing to bear the blunt his last words were don't trouble about me a letter written to his mother a few months before he died on his twenty-eighth birthday is one of the most remarkable and beautiful letters of the war letter of arthur heath july eleventh nineteen fifteen my dear mother it is sunday and though we shall be working all the same in a few hours i feel that i should like to take the opportunity of telling you some things i've wanted to say now for a long time you remembered that i told you when i was going that nothing worried me so much as the thought of the trouble i was causing you by going away or might cause you if i was killed now that death is near i feel the same I don't think for myself that I've more than the natural instinct of self-preservation, and I certainly do not find the thought of death a great terror that weighs on me. 
i feel rather that if i were killed it would be you and those that love me that would have the real burden to bear and i am writing this letter to explain why after all i do not think it should be regarded as merely a burden it would at least ease my feelings to try and make the explanation we make the division between life and death as if it were one of dates being born at one date and dying some years after but just as we sleep half our lives so when we're awake too we know that often we're only half alive life in fact is a quality rather than a quantity and there are certain moments of real life whose value seems so great that to measure them by the clock and find them to have lasted so many hours or minutes must appear trivial and meaningless their power indeed is such that we cannot properly tell how long they last for they can color all the rest of our lives and remain a source of strength and joy that you know not to be exhausted even though you cannot trace exactly how it works the first time i ever heard brahms requiem remains with me as an instance of what i mean afterwards you do not look back on such events as mere past things whose position in time can be localized you still feel as living the power that first awoke in them now if such moments could be preserved and the rest strained off none of us could wish for anything better and just as these moments of joy or elevation may fill our own lives so too they may be prolonged in the experience of our friends and exercising their power in those lives may know a continual resurrection you won't mind a personal illustration i know that one of the ways i live in the truest sense is in the enjoyment of music now just as the first hearing of the requiem was for me more than an event which passed away so i would like to hope that my love of music might be for those who love and survive me more than a memory of something past a power rather that can enhance for them the beauty of music itself or again we love the south down country now i would hate to think that if i died the associations would make these hills too painful for you as people sometimes say i would like to think the opposite that the joy i had in the downs might not merely be remembered by you as a fact in the past but rather be as it were transfused into you and give a new quality of happiness to your holidays there will you at least try if i am killed not to let the things i have loved cause you pain but rather to get increased enjoyment from the sussex downs or from janey singing folk songs because i have found such joy in them and in that way the joy i have found can continue to live and again do not have all this solemn funeral music dead marches and so on played over me as if to proclaim that all has now come to an end and nothing better remains to those who loved one than a dignified sorrow i would rather have the dutch easter carol where the music gives you the idea of life and joy springing up continually and if what i have written seems unreal and fantastic to you at least there's one thing with which you'll agree the will to serve now is in both of us and you approve of what i am doing now that is just one of the true and vital things that must not be and is not exhausted by the moment at which it is felt or expressed my resolution can live on in yours even if i am taken and in your refusal to regret what we know to have been a right decision it can prove itself undefeated by death please forgive me if i have worried you by all this talk if we loved one another less i could not have written this and just because we love one another i cannot bear to think that if i died i should only give you trouble and sorrow all my love to you arthur observer b de p monsieur victor giraud who has collected a good many french war letters says of a letter written by a young aviator that nothing more young more fresh more noble and more pure has come to his notice 
and he suggests that we do not often think enough of the parents and grandparents of these heroes of the long line of traditions obscure devotions secret virtues of which they are the happy outcome and the witness the boy's name is not given although in his letter he says the great general who decorated him said the name was not unknown to him and we learn that his father was a brave man before him such a letter as m giraud says does as much honour to the family that received it as to the son who wrote it letter of observer bay de pay all my happiness is increased by the honour i am going to do to my old warrior father by this cross that is going to shine on my breast i have been officially cited for the legion of honour i shall have it in a few days i am very proud i had the choice between promotion and the cross so much the worse for the stripes papa often said to me it is a piece of foolishness but my faith it is chic it tempts and delights me the stripes are money this cross is glory i am still a little under the shock of the emotion and i hardly know how to tell it all to you i have not slept this night i kept seeing the poor enemy awaited on the other side by their own and i knew the anxiety that crushes you when one of our birds is across the enemy's lines and is a long time coming back i thought of their mothers of their sisters of their wives perhaps there is a pilot a lieutenant and the observer a captain we met about twenty seven hundred meters up i had thrown overboard glasses gloves and the whole business I was able to fire four shots and three hit one killed dead the captain observer straight in the heart another broke one of the pilot's arms at the same time piercing his reservoir the third passed through his neck they went down like a water spout but the pilot very skilful was able to make a landing with one arm and the machine was uninjured we swooped down after them like a vulture after its prey it was magnificent never never can you imagine what it was on the ground i leaped out of my machine the observer dead at his post was lifeless the pilot salutes and surrenders my faith you will laugh but i fell upon that young fellow and shook his hand with all my strength he understood and i saw in his eyes that he knew what was passing in my heart in the evening the commanding general summoned to headquarters the pilot gilbert and myself and congratulated us warmly it was de castelnau our name was not unknown to him he told me he was very nice and i assure you it is an interview not soon to be forgotten i would like it if the cross i am going to wear could be one of those that papa wore for so long can you not find me one of those croix de chevalier i haven't the time to write more i am a little unnerved but very well and contented and happy in your happiness may dear papa also be happy i thought of him also up there at the great moment of the attack i had good chances not to return sweet and fleeting images your features and your names were in my heart during my last prayer up there up there it was solemn and sweet and as always i have been protected blessed thanks dear god thanks for your tenderness your prayers your love which make me so strong so brave god punish england in a new volume of the oxford dictionary volume nine the word strafe appears for the first time strafe verb slang from the german phrase gott strafe england god punish england a common salutation in germany in nineteen fourteen and the following years used originally by british soldiers in the war against germany in various senses suggested by its origin to punish, to do damage to, to attack fiercely, to heap imprecations on. Among the citations given is one from the London Times Literary Supplement. The Germans are called the Gottstraffers, and a strafe is becoming a comic English word. And another from the London Daily Mail. 
the word strafe is now almost universally used not only is an effective bombardment of the enemy's lines or a successful trench raid described by tommy as strafing the fritzes but there are occasions when certain brass hats are strafed by imprecation and quite recently the present writer heard a working-class woman shout to one of her offspring wait till i get hold of yer i'll strafe yer i will london punch printed a picture showing a german family going through its morning hate ceremonies it all sounds like something out of a comic weekly but in its issue of december five nineteen fourteen the norddeutsche allgemeine zeitung printed the following letter from the front written by a lieutenant of the landwehr to the hanover advertiser letter of god punish england as a good hanoverian i send you from french soil the heartiest true german greeting and beg you to grant a modest corner to the following lines god punish england may he punish her that is the new greeting of our troops suggested by some one or other it is spreading he who hears it for the first time is surprised understands and it goes further on its round everywhere here when an officer or private enters a room he does not say good day or even adieu when he goes out but god punish england and the answer may he punish her oh it is pleasant to german ears and the customary greeting has seldom been so much reflected upon as now may he punish her yes indeed that is what we want and that is why we germans have come away and left our homes and our families to punish all who have robbed us of peace and you dear ones at home you men who remain behind keep it before your eyes our motto is like yours god punish england and when you are sitting at your usual table in the restaurant think of it don't say prosit when you drink no do like us say god punish england and answer may he punish her it refreshes the heart when the company leader greets his company in the morning instead of wishing a good morning for every morning close to the enemy is to us a good morning we do not need to wish one another that but an iron voice rings across the market-place of v attention god punish england and from three hundred throats there meets us the cry may he punish her perhaps the greeting will also take up its abode in our dear hanover for the period of the campaign and perhaps other newspapers and other german districts will take up the suggestion and with this good-bye may he punish her printed in the Norddeutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, December 5, 1914. Pierre Maurice Masson The tragic sense of loss is in no case felt more than in the story of Pierre Maurice Masson, professor of French literature at the University of Fribourg, and the author of many noteworthy biographical studies. In the summer of 1916, Lieutenant Masson was expecting a permit to return to the trenches of the Sorbonne, as he phrased it, to receive his doctor's degree. He had corrected and read the proof of his masterwork on Rousseau at the front, and now, as he wrote to his friends, the monster is ready. But he did not get his permit. The activity of the Crown Prince at Verdun caused all permits to be recalled man proposes he writes and the boches dispose inclined to fret a little at first he nevertheless says that his bad luck is a mere bagatelle compared with the future of the world and when he gets the command of his company he is wholly content and writes that he has become resigned and no longer thinks of anything but the war i send to the devil the sorbon and likewise the permits and i only desire to attend strictly to my business it is a hard and beautiful business and i would not give my place commanding the company for all the sinecures back there pierre maurice masson was a son of lorraine having been born at metz in eighteen seventy nine he was one of the alsace lorraine protesters he was for la revanche but for the revenge of justice as he said 
in 1911 he wrote that the time for all silence and restraint was past and that france should not be afraid to say we do not accept the brigandage and we demand the return of our stolen property justice is the word most frequently found in his letters the war must not be terminated until justice is done we have suffered too much in the name of justice he writes to his wife to accept a peace without it of one of his friends killed in the war he writes that he has waked in that eternal serenity that awaits the defenders of justice he tells his wife that whatever happens they must have courage and hold to the end it was his strong sense of justice no doubt that explains lieutenant masson's unusually even for the french sympathetic relations with the men he commanded this quality in the anonymous peril he writes has something fraternal about it that is very salutary just because he will leave a few old books behind he does not believe makes his life worth any more than that of the men whose uncomplaining heroism he is never tired of praising some of them know that their villages have been burned their homes pillaged and their wives and children have fled they know not where and yet they refuse to think of anything but of la patrie and its welfare every time he talks with the soldiers and there is time he says to talk on the long night marches he feels himself inferior and this is the reason as he writes to his wife why he tries to do little things for them show interest in their lives and families and worries and he adds almost naively they feel i think that this interest is sincere M. Victor Giraud, whom Professor Masson succeeded at Freiburg, says that his letters are among the most beautiful of the war letters, and that one of them, at least, is destined to become classic, the description he wrote to his wife of the trenches at Fleury, where he later lost his life. Letter of Pierre Maurice Masson Through shining acres of the musket spears, where flame and wither with swift intercease flowers of red sleep that not the cornfield bears francis thompson june nineteenth nineteen fifteen i find your letter on returning from our visit to the fleury trenches we left in an automobile at two o'clock this morning and were for three and a half hours in the trenches that face fort mar it is one of the most active sectors in all this part one of those where the bombardment is continuous it is precisely for that reason that we made our visit at dawn because this is the time when both sides by mutual agreement each worn out by the hard night drops guns mortars and grenades and goes to sleep and in fact it was very quiet all the time we were there but the stretcher bearers who were coming down just as we arrived testified to the activity of the night i see again especially in one of the narrow trenches carried by two men in a sailcloth like some poor dead game a sort of human rag that a shell has pulverized but what is one dead in this vast cemetery the first line trench that has been captured from the germans and that has seen some furious hand-to-hand -hand fighting several times changing hands is only an ancient charnel house where the walls the parapets the loopholes are builded of human dough one still sees here and there a foot sticking out a back humped into a piece of buttress little by little all the wretchedness has been concealed by being clothed with sandbags but it is only a poor screen the frightful acrid odor that chokes you the incessant buzzing of great green flies that swarm over the debris are enough to remind you where you are and to tell that men live here in this cadaverous earth in this tragic plague spot which the sun fecundates and spreads along the narrow trench one sees men pass with the little copper sprayers that the vine dressers use when they go to spray the vines they sprinkle with chloride of lime and disinfectants the vines of the dead and moreover the genuine vine of tulle still grows here in this earth enriched by blood and baked by the sun everything has rank growth 
between the parapets among the old bags the abandoned equipment in the rottenness and the rubbish in the midst of the chaos dug by the shells one sees the roots of vines or rather new shoots of a veritable green growth further there are a lot of potato sprouts and above all fields of wild poppies of a glorious red blazing that seem the blooming of all the blood that has watered this ground how a human life seems a small thing an insignificant thing in this jumble of corpses of springtime renewal and careless happy existence for all along this bloody labyrinth young polis who do not say all that they feel and who perhaps no longer feel sleep peacefully laugh or play manui while waiting for the shell that is going to kill them coningsby dawson and was i really the budding novelist in new york coningsby dawson writes in one of his letters but he was more than the budding novelist the first novel he wrote the garden without walls had an immediate and enviable success in interrupting his career to enter the war he probably gave up more than most yet from the mud banks of the somme he exclaims apparently with innermost conviction the insufficiency of merely setting nobilities down on paper and in another letter with equal conviction oh if i get back how differently i will write coningsby dawson was graduated from oxford with honors in nineteen o five and in the same year came to the united states with the intention of studying for the ministry but after a year at a theological seminary he decided upon a literary career which he was pursuing with great earnestness and good promise when the war came in the introduction to his book carry on his father writes from the very first he saw clearly where his duty lay he enlisted with the canadian field artillery letter of coningsby dawson september fifteenth nineteen sixteen dear father it's a fortnight to-day since i left england and already i've seen action things move more quickly in this game one which brings out both the best and the worst qualities in a man if unconscious heroism is the virtue most to be desired and heroism spiced with a strong sense of humour at that then pretty well every man i have met out here has the amazing guts to wear his crown of thorns as though it were a cap and bells to do that for the sake of corporate stout-heartedness is i think the acme of what aristotle meant by virtue a strong man or a good man or a brainless man can walk to meet pain with a smile on his mouth because he knows that he is strong enough to bear it or worthy enough to defy it or because he is such a fool that he has no imagination but these chaps are neither particularly strong good or brainless they're more like children utterly casual with regard to trouble and quite aware that it is useless to struggle against their elders so they have the merriest of times while they can and when the governess death summons them to bed they obey her with unsurprised quietness it sends the mercury of one's optimism rising to see the way they do it i search my mind to find the bigness of motive which supports them but it forever evades me these lads are not the kind who philosophize about life they're the sort many of them who would ordinarily wear corduroys and smoke a cutty pipe i suppose the christian martyrs would have done the same had corduroys been the fashion in that day and if a roman raleigh had discovered tobacco ever yours with love con end of part two part three of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain a sans syrienne the famous vow of the sans syrienne the young french officers corresponding to american west pointers is that they will go into battle wearing their white gloves and their red and white plumes in their caps and as they go gallantly forth to battle in all their bravery so they ask the people at home to put on their gala attire to meet them on their return it was a saint syrienne who wrote 
when the troops come home victorious through the arc de triomphe put on your finest apparel and be there and another wrote we shall perhaps not be there but others will be there for us do not weep do not wear mourning for we shall have died with a smile on our lips and a superhuman joy in our heart vive la france vive la france how well the injunction has been obeyed is illustrated in the story that has been told many times of the young french wife searching the faces of the marching soldiers for her husband and who when one stepped out of the ranks to tell her that her husband had been killed the day before raised her child high in her arms and cried vive la france in the following letter written by a saint syrien by name gaston Vuizard, m barrieres who quotes it says he seems almost to apologize for outliving some of his brother officers by a few months the letter is written on christmas night nineteen fourteen his turn did not come until the following april the letter is one of the few addressed to a demoiselle most of the letters of the frenchmen especially are written to mothers letter of a saint syrien december twenty five nineteen eighteen it is midnight mademoiselle and good friend and in order to write to you i have just removed my white gloves this is not a bid for admiration the act has nothing of the heroic about it my last coloured pair adorn the hands of a poor foot soldier piu -piu, who was cold i am unable to find words to express the pleasure and emotion caused me by your letter which arrived in the evening following a terrific bombardment of the poor little village we are holding the letter was accepted among us as a balm for all possible racking of nerves and other curses that letter which was read in the evening to the officers of my battalion i ask pardon for any offence to your modesty comforted the most cast down after the hard day and gave proof to all that the heart of the young girls of france is nothing short of magnificent in its beneficence it is as i have said midnight to the honour and good fortunes which have come to me of commanding my company during the last week our captain having been wounded i owe the pleasure of writing you at this hour from the trenches where by prodigies of cunning i have succeeded in lighting a candle without attracting the attention of the gentlemen facing us who are by the way not more than a hundred metres distant my men under their breath have struck up the traditional christmas hymn he is born the child divine the sky glitters with stars one feels like making merry over all this and behold one is on the brink of tears i think of christmases of other years spent with my family i think of the tremendous effort still to be made of the small chance i have for coming out of this alive i think in short that perhaps this minute i am living my last christmas regret do you say no not even sadness only a tinge of gloom at not being among those i love all the sorrow of my thoughts is given to those best of friends fallen on the field of honour whose loyal affection has made them almost my brothers alliard fayol so many dear friends whom i shall never see again when on the evening of july thirty first in my capacity of pere systeme of the promotion i had pronounced amid a holy hush the famous vow to make ourselves conspicuous by facing death wearing white gloves our good-hearted fayot who was i may say the most of an enthusiast of all the friends i have ever known said to me with a grin what a stunning impression we shall make upon the bosch they will be so astounded that they will forget to fire but alas poor fayot has paid dearly his debt to his country for the title of saint syrien and they are all falling around me seeming to ask when the time of their pierre system is to come so that montmeret on entering heaven may receive god's blessing with full ranks but a truce to useless repinings let us give thought only to dear france our indispensable imperishable ever-living country and by this beauteous christmas night let us put our faith more firmly than ever in victory i must ask you mademoiselle and good friend to excuse this awful scrawl 
will you allow me to hope for a reply in the near future and will you permit this young french officer very respectfully to kiss the hand of a great-souled and generous-hearted maiden of france robert ernest verned little you'd care what i laid at your feet ribbon or crest or shawl what if i bring you nothing sweet nor maybe come home at all ah but you'll know brave heart you'll know two things i'll have kept to send my honour for which you bade me go and my love my love to the end r e Vernet. some one has said that middle age always a blunder has become since the war a sort of crime but for robert ernest Vernet, his nearly forty years were neither although four years over age he enlisted early in the war as a private edmund gosse who has written in praise of the generous gesture with which the youth of the world greeted the sacrifice of their hopes and ours says some praise should be reserved for those who having been brought face to face with the illusions of youth had got into the habit of not being soldiers robert ernest Vernet habits were the furthest from a soldier's when the war came he was married and deep in a hertfordshire garden he was an oxford man a novelist and a poet he was born in london in eighteen seventy five but was of french extraction robert louis stevenson in his travels with a donkey mentions the ancestral castle of the Fernets. he not only went to the war voluntarily but having returned home wounded once he went again and this time he did not return he was killed leading an attack on Havricourt wood april ninth nineteen sixteen it was thus his friend chesterton writes that he passed from the english country life he loved so much with its gardening and dreaming to an ambush and a german gun his letters were written to his wife they are filled with his contentment with what he is doing and with his admiration for the fighting men he thinks the men are wonderful and awfully good to one another even the cook exposes himself to danger to assist the stretcher-bearers which i'm afraid will render me weak-minded towards his cookery in the future he writes the only cheerful thing is the sun when it appears and the men whose cheeriness is unending nor is it the sort of heedless gaiety i used to suspect them of but a gallant effort to make the best of things and not let their morale fall below an ideal he himself is always in the pink as he is fond of saying and he quotes from a tommy's letter dear mum and dad and dear loving sister rosie letty and our gladys i hope you keeps the home fires burning not arf the boys are in the pink not arf more than most the issues of the war were simple direct and clear to this englishman a case of right and wrong darkness and light democratic civilization and dynastic and military rule of one of his poems before the assault written at the front and acknowledged to be one of the finest of the war poems chesterton says no printed controversy or political eloquence could put more logically let alone more poetically the higher pacifism which is resolute to dry up at the fountain-head the bitter waters of the dynastic wars than these four lines then to our children there shall be no handing of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord in one of the letters he refers to this poem letter of robert ernest Fernet i rather foresee a time after peace when people will be sick of the name of war won't hear a word of it or anything connected with it there seem to be such people now and i see numbers of silly books and papers advertised as having nothing to do with the war it's natural perhaps that soldiers should want a diversion and even civilians but i rather hope that people won't altogether forget it in our generation that's what i wanted to say in the verses i began about not in our time o lord we now beseech thee to grant us peace the sword has bit too deep but never got on with what i mean is that for us there can be no real forgetting 
we have seen too much of it known too many people's sorrow felt it too much to return to an existence in which it has no part not that one wants to be morbid about it later but still less does one want to be as superficial as before the sword has bit too deep andre cornet Auquier. andre cornet Coquier was a professor before the war although before he died he had determined to remain in the army where he thought his country's need was greater his letters were written from the alsatian front to his parents like so many of these soldiers letters especially the french they are remarkable not only for their spirit but their literary excellence also like so many of the french soldiers and contrary to popular belief this young french captain is deeply religious his faith is unwavering and he says with him prayer is a constant state but if any one thinks his piety interferes with his gaiety he is mistaken how i make them laugh he writes in one letter he quotes the rules and regulations for the grand hotel of the trenches how they must not leave the gas burning nor carry off the sandbags nor lean out of the windows nor especially have anything to do with the rival concern over the way he is very sure that the neighbors over the way are not as gay as we the french captain is constantly imploring his parents to be brave and not let their affection for him be a source of weakness to him but on the contrary an armor he asked his mother particularly to be the most french of all admirable french mothers and say to herself that no life whatsoever not even that of thine own son is anything in comparison with the salvation of the country captain cornet Auquier's last letter dated february twenty ninth nineteen sixteen closes with the words i am going to bed without even eating so weary am i he was mortally wounded on march one and died the next day he received the war cross and the cross of the legion of honor although he says with all the business in hand there is not much time to think of honors and advancements he was twenty eight perhaps because of the numerous english uncles whom he mentions his idea of what the allies are fighting for most nearly coincides with that most often expressed by an englishman or an american that the war is against war letter of andre cornet Auquier. how i would like to feel that you are ready even before it comes to make if necessary the sacrifice of my life how i would like to be able to say to myself at least they are ready and if my death should be painful to them they are resigned to it resigned in advance i also have moments of impatience especially when i feel myself so full of youth and strength when i reflect on all that i have abandoned of work hopes all that future which was smiling on me at such moments i wish it were all ended but this morning i began reflecting on what is the life of an individual in comparison with the general peace of all the nations of europe nothing my hour has perhaps not yet sounded it will probably come i no longer pray for myself but for the others for you all and for thee mother especially and how ardent fervent passionate is that prayer i ask god to make you all calm and brave whatever happens i would be a hundredfold stronger if i knew that you were joyously ready and especially do not look upon me as a hero or a wonder no what have i done that is extraordinary nothing i have tried to do my duty like everybody else that's all what are our lives worth when we think of the years of happiness and peace of those who will follow us and those who may survive us we labor for to-morrow in order that there may be no more wars no more spilling of blood no more killing no more wounded no more mutilated victims we labor we whom our mothers will so weep for in order that other mamas may never know these bitter tears in truth when one thinks of the centuries that this peace will last one is ashamed of the rebellious movements which the flesh is guilty of at certain moments at the thought of death marcel et Tevez. 
Marcel Etive was a student at the École Normale in Paris. He was an accomplished musician and had already had some success as a composer. He was twenty-four years old. He was put at the head of his column because of his great height. The part of the trench he occupied, he writes jestingly to a friend, he has had dug deeper because his head stuck out, and he is too lazy to stoop, and moreover he has a right to be comfortable. What a bizarre and joyous war, when you think of it from one point of view and not from another. We must amuse ourselves like little fools, he says, and the joys of trench life have hardly been exaggerated. To be sure, he regrets his music in the midst of the caroming of the cannon and the snoring of the men, but he hopes that what he loses in study he may gain in spontaneity of impressions, if he is ever permitted to replunge into civilized harmonies, which is his heart's desire. In the meantime, he reads everything, apparently, including my dear Kipling. Lieutenant Etive was very popular with his men. It is said he never asked them to do anything he did not do himself at least once. He writes to his mother that the main thing is that they be willing, not afraid, and love me a little. Etive was killed in the Picardy attack in July 1916. His company had taken almost immediately the enemy's trench, but soon after was cut off from all communication with the rear. For an hour it defended itself with grenades. Already wounded in the shoulder, Lieutenant Etive was in a good deal of pain, but he kept his command. Second Lieutenant M. came up to him and said, My old fellow, if in five minutes we don't get reinforcements, we are dead. We are not going to get them. Adieu. Etive replied, I know it, but let us not say anything about it in order not to discourage the men. Adieu. A few minutes later he received a bullet in the head. His name was given to the trench when it was finally definitely held, and the standard of the company, when it also died and was disbanded, to which her son gave its first ray of glory, was sent to the mother for the school which she directs. Most of Lieutenant Etive's letters are written to his mother. They are love letters, like so many of the letters to mothers. I am decorated, he writes to her, on my heart are the golden fringes of the flag. In my cartridge box are three little violets filched from your bouquet. He says he can die because, thanks to you, I have already had a life longer and fuller than the majority of men. He says he loves her with all his soul, which you have fashioned. His last words to her are, let us hope and love each other hard, hard. He had been fortunate in falling in with a group of officers who are so kind, as he tells his mother, and agreeable, and also intellectual. Not one of them, he says, is militaire to excess, and in the worst sense of the word. It was about militarism and frightfulness and war on war that he wrote to his friend letter of marcel et Eve. you speak of the war on war and you seem to think i do not agree with you what kind of a brute do you think i am is it my little speeches in favor of the poor militaires that warrant you in doing me such an injustice could you think that the soldiers i was defending were different from you and me submitting to the war as the worst of catastrophes and that i was one of those who see in it the normal employment of their faculties however if it is necessary to make a full confession perhaps i have something to do with your misunderstanding for some time in fact i tried half seriously to acquire to a certain degree a mind for military purposes but it was not serious and i never had great confidence in the business i have emphatically not the required hate and i have resolved not to bother any more about it knowing that i do not need the stimulus to begin at the bottom i shall have in fact every time that it shall be necessary to strike hard and cruelly the blind rage of combat and it is much in climbing a little higher up the ladder of motives i shall have also the necessary self-esteem and proper bearing and that is something to go on 
Finally, even from a still more intellectual point of view, I shall have the conscience to perform a necessary duty, and to take part, from this moment, in the war on war, and let it go at that. THE SOLDIER PRIEST A world war, more than American politics, makes strange bedfellows. A French soldier priest describes the following incident of the retreat from Charleroi. One evening four of us, a Protestant preacher, a rabbi, an officer who called himself a freethinker, and I, had the good luck to find a bed, without any bedding, of course, and a mattress. Quick, quick, let us draw lots. The preacher sleeps with the rabbi, the old with the New Testament, and dogma, which I represent, lies down by the side of free thinking. In less than two minutes there is a wonderful concert, the like of which no great religious congress could produce. Another story is also told of the dying Catholic soldier who asked the Jewish stretcher-bearer for a crucifix, and the Jew brought a crucifix, and a few moments afterwards was himself hit by a shell and died in the arms of a Catholic priest. The democratization and fraternization going on in the armies is thus likewise producing a greater tolerance and sympathy in those of opposing religious beliefs. In fact, what with the fighting priest and the chaplain, not arf, as the British Tommy says, meaning the highest praise, and the YMCA young man and a Cardinal Messier, one of the great heroes of the Great War, all religion is giving a pretty good account of itself in the war and deserves to be decorated with a special cross which the allied armies would hardly use as a movable target to direct their firing as the germans used a cross in flanders there are those who believe that anti-clericalism in france especially will be less popular after the war owing to the heroism and self-sacrificing spirit shown by the fighting priests who cheerfully acquiesced in the law that made them soldiers and whose rallying cry as they march to battle is vivant les curés ça au dos everybody mourns according to his own needs and desires brand whitlock american minister to former belgium tells that the scholarly old priest who described to him the destruction of ypres never wavered while he told of his brothers and friends shot down before his eyes but when he reached the fate of the library that priceless collection of books he could not even say the word but stammered biblio bib and bowed his head upon his arms and wept a young french priest abbe philippe in writing about it indulges in a little irony at the expense of culture so long as he is telling about the destruction of the halls and other buildings but when he comes to the church la maison de dieu this is what touches him most nearly and it is here that the young priest weeps and he writes that there must be no weakening until the hour for justice comes and there is a healing victory letter of a soldier priest ypres one could pray in this town as in a temple it is a shrine a relic all is sacred literally there is not a building that has not been shelled pierced with bullets riddled disemboweled doorless windowless roofless ruins of walls piles of stone here a broken column lying on the ground there a portico everywhere the stigmata of the shells they have destroyed for the sake of destroying there is no excuse for such devastation churches halls stalls little homes of small merchants workshops why this frightfulness against all these there is no strategic reason that will hold why this rage against a belgian town the city of a people drawn into the war in spite of themselves from whom one only pretended to ask a passage through and whom one is able to reproach only for being loyal even to sacrifice it is rage it is hate it is madness it is satanic one repeats a thousand times the name of pompey in connection with Ypres it comes spontaneously to the lips but at pompeii more things must have been respected at pompeii pretty statuettes were found uninjured you will find none at ypres 
and also in the case of pompeii it was a natural force it was the volcano it was the earth giving birth to something there was still on the horizon a beauty which pliny could contemplate it was hot ashes spouting from the entrails of the earth and falling like a veil on the city adip it is the work of man against man human brutality against justice and against beauty heavy shells of teuton metal each seeking out its building guided by a human will the work of science in revolt against humanity and against art no excuse nothing but horror there is only one word that explains it all sin the word haunts me like an obsession there are great holes everywhere down low up high low in the streets high in the walls in what once were houses are the remains of what once was life a table a counter with bottles shelves of a grocery store workshops the thousand little everyday things curtains debris of bedding lace a piano and i reflect here was a home a shelter of love and of hope there were old people who watched the young growing up while saying they will take our place they will have more comfort more happiness than we have had where are they all now the big and the little just now a man said to me i have obtained permission to re-enter this house which is mine my son has been killed and is lying out there and his young daughter added while picking a rose for us you see one cannot be separated from what one has planted from what one has planted all the hopes affections centered in these homes now uprooted all is a desert all someone near to me asks what will one do with these ruins after the war and i answered as if mechanically a museum and one will put over the entrance kultur it is the inevitable thought of everyone in the presence of this devastation if there is any irony in me it lasts only a moment it is frozen upon my visit to the churches i have tears in my eyes it is as if a mailed fist clutched my heart i can hardly breathe i grow pale i am sick physically i am sick to my soul i wish i had not entered i wish i had not seen it is necessary to push open what is left of the tottering doors or mount the piles of stone and go through the breaches in the walls no longer any altar a little heap of stones or marble broken columns lying on the ground all the stones of a pillar disjointed and thrown down one on top of the other like a heap of great copper sous spilled out the stained glass powder the lead melted the railings of the pulpit identate the pipes of the organ twisted and its case suspended in the air almost all the statues thrown down as if in profanation here an arm there a leg here a torso there a head and such queer freaks of the wreckage this saint with a crutch thrown down as an infirm old man whom the mischievous hand of a child had pushed over in the arms of the virgin an infant jesus with the head broken in two and the fingers of one of the hands broken off while the other still holds the world it smiles such a sad little smile a virgin has a bullet in her temple a saint roch has an authentic wound while his dog has a broken foot there is a new and surprising detail in every statue the pictures are full of holes and here is a beautiful triptych painted on wood that holds out its sagging doors like broken wings god is then the first victim and it is necessary to live until the hour comes for justice for a healing victory End of part three.